Do you want to become an astronaut? If so, you've come to the right place, because this one definitely is not it. I'm just here to tell you that your dream of becoming an astronaut is completely not off the table, but you might want to start thinking about it a lot more. Because mind you, not all spaceflight missions go successful. Some of them would lead you to crash and burn, literally. A little bit of foreshadowing here. There's been a technical delay, so give me two seconds. Apollo 1. This happened on the 27th of January, 1967. The Apollo 1 crew consisted of astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward H. White II, and Roger B. Chaffee. These three men were doing a pre-flight test for the first-ever manned mission of the Apollo program, and if you haven't realized it yet, the first-ever successful mission of the Apollo program was the Apollo 7, which means six more Apollos crashed and burned after the first one. Very nice. The three astronauts were actually veterans when it came to spacewalking. Grissom was a member of the Mercury and Gemini programs. White was also a part of the Gemini thingy, where he walked in space during the Gemini 4 mission, and Chaffee has been a part of NASA since 1963. At the time, these three are the best men you need to get in order to do a proper spaceflight mission. Well, they might have been the best men for the mission, the ship definitely wasn't. The crew noticed a strange smell in their oxygen supply, and it was described as a sour smell by Grissom. But even if the sour smell had been noticed, they still continued the testing. That wasn't the only issue, though. How are we going to get to the moon if we can't talk between two or three buildings, says Grissom, because the communication problems were not the experience he was anticipating. Problems like this happened here and there. A lot of technical difficulties delayed the simulated countdown so much that even a fire broke out in the command module where the place was filled with oxygen and some other flammable materials, like nylon. A little bit of Science 101 for you. Oxygen is very reactive when it comes to catching fire. Combine that with an easily flammable material like nylon, you will either turn into the Human Torch or Ghost Rider. Pick your burn. Chaffee was the one who noticed the fire. He was like, fire in the cockpit, in the most nonchalant way. And then White basically said the same thing, but this time with more urgency. The three men had a hard time opening the inward opening hatch, which is a way to call spaceship doors, considering that it was designed to be secure under pressure, but proved it was basically impossible to open in times of emergency, like this one. It turns out, that was the only emergency that they needed to know that the door was not working properly because, yeah, they died from the thick smoke and the asphyxiation and so many burns. When an investigation was held, it was intelligently guessed that the fire was caused by a short circuit in the wiring inside the spacecraft. Well, it had to happen for science. Challenger STS-51L 28th of January, and the year was 1986. It was unusually cold on the morning of the launch, and it was affecting the O-rings or the seals inside the rocket boosters of the Space Shuttle Challenger. The managers at NASA could not possibly care because it was already delayed by so many environmental factors. So they were like, yeah, we're not holding this off any longer. To infinity and beyond my dear astronauts, the temperature recommended for the ship to normally operate at launch was 53 degrees Fahrenheit, or 11 and a half degrees Celsius. It was 36 degrees Fahrenheit, or close to freezing temperature that day. Would you believe me if I told you that the O-ring would be the cause of this massive accident? If you don't, you better believe it, because this was the reason that just 73 seconds after the launch, the O-ring in the right solid rocket booster failed. It basically snapped and allowed hot gases to escape, which damaged the external fuel tank. And another Science 101 for you. Hot gas mixed with fuel in a tank that's constantly burning. It's kaboom. The shuttle broke apart in mid-air, and all of its pieces that were still solid fell into the Atlantic Ocean. All seven members of the crew died, and yeah, there wasn't anyone left. The Rogers Commission investigated this accident, and right off the bat, they said that the failure of the O-rings was due to the cold weather. You don't say. But there was actually something more that they found out, apart from the obvious. They saw that NASA's decision-making process on some problems was not very NASA of them and that they wanted publicity over the safety of everyone on board. Soyuz 1. This one happened in the middle of the Cold War when the arms race and space race was a big thing and that's why there was a huge increase in astronauts and cosmonauts appearing in the US and the USSR. So of course it was inevitable that some of these space race missions on who can get out of the world faster did not go as planned, and this was one of them. This happened on the 23rd of April, 1976. The Soyuz 1 is a spacecraft that was launched by the USSR from the Baikonur Cosmodrome as part of the Ha Ha! We're faster than you going to space. Take that USA missions. But it was 1967, 
We're not expecting that it's going to be the most advanced and high-tech spaceship right off the bat, especially when it's the earliest times of us going outside our planet. When Soyuz 1 reached orbit, one of the two solar panels failed to deploy, and there was, let's say, a little bit of a power outage after that. And the malfunction kind of hindered the spaceship's automatic stabilization system, which forced the cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov to attempt manual control, which was definitely ineffective. Because the ship was definitely compromised from having no electricity and no power, and being in orbit without any propellers in there yet to maneuver. So yeah, he was just basically floating in space. You're not gonna believe this, but even with all those problems already in there, the mission continued, without having to launch the second spaceship because of a lot of ground problems. By the 13th orbit of the ship around the Earth, it was obvious that the mission had to be cancelled, because Komarov was about to become the second Laika if the MUDOK Soviet ground control weren't any considerate. So they asked the Soyuz-1 to go back to Earth on its 19th orbit. Ait, said Komarov, thinking everything was going to be fine, because he's about to re-enter the Earth and kiss his beloved Soviet Union. The start of the descent was normal where the initial parachute was deployed seamlessly, and it also seamlessly went from OK to I'm about to die type of situation in less than a second when the main parachute failed to deploy. The parachutes are there to slow the spacecraft down and not nosedive to the ground. That's, that's how safe landing works. The reason that the main parachute did not deploy was from the problem earlier, which was electricity. Cosmonaut Komarov tried to play hero to himself by deploying the parachute manually, but it got tangled with the initial parachute, and now both parachutes are ineffective. Really great. Because of that, the spacecraft crashed into the ground at 140 km an hour, with almost nothing to slow it down apart from the aerodynamics of the ship. It crashed 65 km east of Orsk. Because the crash was from a very great height, which was basically our space, the ship went from 2 meters tall to just 70 centimeters, or from 6 feet to just a little over 2 feet. If the space version of the Ocean Gate disaster wasn't enough, the rockets that were designed to ease the landing over the ship fired upon impact, so the ship turned pancake is now burning. The rescue teams arrived very fast, but they saw the ship already being eaten by fire, and it was releasing really black smoke. They knew from then and there that Komarov was either burnt or pancaked. It was the first one, and the second one, because it was discovered that its body was strapped into the center couch, which was flattened really badly, and it was so burnt that burnt is not the right way to describe his body anymore, but charred. Borderline disintegrated. All that and many more deaths to prove a point to USA that USSR is better when it comes to going out in space. Shout out to Yuri Gagarin. The Nedelin catastrophe. Marshal Mitrofan Nedelin was one of those quote-unquote leaders of the Soviet Union's strategic missile forces. He was basically at the head of the development of the R-16, which is an ICBM. If you don't know what an intercontinental ballistic missile is, it's basically a rocket that goes very far. To start things off, it was rushed, and all of the things that you should never do at a launch site were done. Oopsie number one, electrical system glitches. There were a lot of these issues all around the R-16 rocket, but the Soviet Union was too determined to launch it and fully fuel the R-16 on the launch pad with 250 personnel working in the area. Oopsie number two, a mistaken switch setting caused the second stage engine to fire while it was still in first gear. I don't think it gets any more obvious what happened, but I'm still going to say it anyway. So the rocket exploded before it even fired up properly and even went off the ground. Apart from that, it released toxic vapors that just cover the entire area where about 250 people were working. The explosion was so big that it instantly obliterated the people near the rocket. It melted the asphalt. So where did the people that were trying to run away from the scene go? Nowhere. They were stuck in the place because of the melted asphalt. The leader, Marshal Nedelin, was one of the people that died because he was standing at the base of the rocket at the time of the explosion, and he was only recognized with the gold star medal he was wearing. Without that, he would just be another Soviet soldier, I guess. When that happened, the USSR automatically was like, you never saw what happened here. You did not know what happened here. You have nothing to say. If you say anything, the KGB will come for you. Since they wanted the explosion to look like an accident, when it was in fact the shortcomings of the program, they went as far as making the official story. Say that Mitrofan Nedelin died from a plane crash, and it wasn't until 1989 that the Soviet government had to admit that what happened to everyone there was simply from an explosion. Soyuz 11. I'm telling you, this is a complete coincidence that I'm seeing the third Russian spaceflight catastrophe that happened. I promise this is not propaganda to make Russia look bad, I'm just doing my research, alright? Anyway, 10 missions apart, the Soyuz 11 was another one for the books. The mission was definitely a successful one, 
they were able to dock into the world's first space station while still having people on board. And that was definitely something that should be a part of history, except for the later parts of the mission. The original crew for Soyuz 11 was composed of Alexei Leonov, Valery Kubasov, and Pyotr Kolodin. Kubasov was suspected of having tuberculosis. That's why the entire crew was replaced with their backups, which was Georgi Dobrovolsky, Viktoria Patsayev, and Vladislav Volkov. These were hard names to pronounce. I deserve a raise for those names alone. The replacement happened only two days before the scheduled launch. On the 6th of June 1971, Soyuz 11 lifted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Soviet Kazakhstan. When they docked the world's first dockable ship on the 7th of June the same year, the crew kind of had a smoky atmosphere inside the station, needing the replacement of a part of the ventilation system. After the air was clear, they returned to the station and had a very successful stay, and it was being broadcast live on many television stations around the planet. Their mission was initially intended to last for only a month, but was cut short because of the issues. Considering the fact that there were only two days that the replacements had to prepare for and some other thingamajigs about the rocket. On the 29th of June 1971, they prepared to return to Earth. With the Earth welcoming back these people who are historically historical, they transferred back to Soyuz 11, undocked from the Salyut 1, at 6.28 in the evening, and performed a deorbit burn at 10.35 p.m. But when this was happening, a cabin vent valve unexpectedly opened. That's why there was a fast release of pressure. The crew had no time to react to even get the emergency oxygen masks. That's why they died from asphyxiation within seconds. The Soyuz 11 landed automatically in Kazakhstan at 11.16 in the evening, where the recovery teams found the dead cosmonauts, and the autopsy reports say that hemorrhages in the brain have happened so fast. Some internal bleedings and even their eardrums were basically ripped. It was successful while it lasted. Satish Dawan Space Center Explosion This one wasn't even an explosion in outer space or even a problem in outer space. This happened on the ground. Back in 2003, the Space Center was testing and processing large solid propellant grains that can be used in satellite launch vehicles. But it just so happened that one of the solid propellants was mishandled. Knowing what solid propellants do, they catch on fire fast, and it can be really dangerous because it can cause deaths. That's basically it. It can cause deaths and it can destroy everything and anything that it can destroy. That's exactly what happened. An unexpected ignition of the propellant happened, and it exploded. India was really secretive about this because, well, they don't want this to cause panic to people. That's why it wasn't fully disclosed. The explosion damaged at least $100 million worth of equipment, and six technicians who were in the facility that time died. X-2 Flight 1 The Bell X-2 was nicknamed the Starbuster. That's a pretty badass name for something that was designed to explore the effects of aerodynamic heating instability issues when someone is traveling at high speeds and high altitudes also known as, does this work? It was actually a collab between the Bell Aircraft Corporation, the Air Force, and the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or the NACA. The Starbuster had two superpower rocket engines called the Curtis Wright XLR-25, and the rocket has some safety features during emergencies so that the pilot would be a lot safer and hopefully not die. Hopefully. Just hopefully. On the 27th of September, 1956, Captain Milburn Apt flew the Starbuster after being brought by the mothership called the B-50 to a height of about 30,000 feet for the power flight. During the 1950s, reaching the speed of sound was already a huge deal. If you're 3.2 times faster than the speed of sound, there's no question that you will be dubbed the fastest man alive during that time, and that's what they called Milburn Apt, the fastest man alive. Take that, Usain Bolt. Although he was the fastest man alive for not so long, he just became the fastest man, not alive. Because following the engine burnout, the X-2 began to swing back and forth uncontrollably, and the Starbuster started spinning very fast. And, uh, it puts Milburn apt to very high gravitational forces. If you've seen those videos where soldiers try to force their faces to stay upright under very high G-forces, this is what happened to him. Even if the X-2 had an advanced design, it was traveling at three times the speed of sound that it became unstable anyways. That's why it was difficult to control. As the X-2 tumbled out of control, the last words that were heard from Milburn Apt's radio transmission were, There she goes! Apt was trying to survive, that's why he tried to separate the escape capsule. The capsule was at the nose of the aircraft, and it was designed with a parachute, so that the pilot could manually bug out of the plane. But that didn't work, and Apt lost consciousness after that. The plane went down very fast towards the desert. 
Since Apt was unable to adjust and deploy the parachute in time, he was still inside the plane when it impacted the ground at 3.2 times the speed of sound. If he was wearing vibranium, he would have definitely survived that, but unfortunately this was in the 1950s and vibranium did not exist ever. So yeah, he died. Brutally. Spaceship 2 VSS Enterprise This happened on the 31st of October 2014. The Spaceship 2 VSS was designed to be carried by a mothership, White Knight 2. Once it's high enough, it will be powered, and it will fire its rocket to the edge of wherever it can go in space. For some reason the names of these spaceships sound like usernames that were used to make your very first World of Warcraft account. This was the early plan to make space tours commercial and available for the rich, because we bourgeoisie definitely will not be able to afford that kind of luxury. Now, when the mothership got separated from the spaceship 2 at about 50,000 feet, everything was going just fine, but just 9 seconds into letting the bird fly on its own, oopsies happened. It was said that an early unlocking of the feathering system happened, which was a system designed to rotate the tail booms to point upwards during re-entry to increase the drag and slow the descent. According to the National Transportation Safety Board, the pilot unlocked the feathering system while the spacecraft was still accelerating and had not yet reached the speed required for a safe deployment. This mistake had resulted in aerodynamic problems because it was not meant to be unlocked at that stage. That's why the plane just got obliterated into nothing. The pilot, Peter Siebold, survived this by parachuting to safety, which was downright badass considering the fact that they weren't wearing any pressure suits or oxygen masks at very high altitudes. Unfortunately, the co-pilot, Michael Alsberry, died. Columbia STS-107 Mission The Columbia STS-107 mission was NASA's 113th Space Shuttle flight and the 28th flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia, and it was launched on the 16th of January 2003. The goal of this mission was for a lot of reasons, actually mostly for scientific experiments, which requires having little to no gravity around the environment. It was a very ambitious idea and a very great mission that we can all look forward to. For the next 82 seconds. After that, a piece of foam insulation broke off from the shuttle's external propellant tank and struck the leading edge of Columbia's left wing. And you know what else happens when a wing gets damaged? Everything gets destroyed. This little damage melted the wing's internal structure, and this was the start of a series of unfortunate events once the internal structure was melted. Everything lost control, and the ship broke apart. This happened over Texas, just 16 minutes before the shuttle was scheduled to land at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. All seven crew members died, and the debris of the space shuttle was scattered all across eastern Texas and Louisiana. Over 25,000 people, including NASA staff, military units, and volunteers, worked to collect debris across hundreds of miles because they wanted to know where it went wrong. Yes, you heard it right. They thanked seven astronauts for their service just to know where things went wrong. Mars 96. This mission was also known as Mars 8, and it was a project by the Russians this time because the Soviet Union was no longer its name since the Iron Curtain completely fell in 1991. From the name itself, you can already see that it is a project that is targeted at exploring Mars. Elon would be proud. It was launched on the 16th of November 1996 from the same place that every rocket from Russia has been launched, the Baikonur Cosmodrome. They wanted to understand what is going on with the surface of Mars, its atmosphere, basically every single thing, and maybe check if there are signs of life there. Mars 96 was equipped with many instruments like Argus, which is a platform with cameras and mapping spectrometers. Some cameras are dedicated to understanding the geological construction of the planet, which is called a high-resolution stereoscopic camera, and then an Omega, which is a visible and infrared mapping spectrometer. This was something great in theory, as I'd like to say it again. But just as it got out of the planet and went into Earth's orbit, the fourth stage of the proton rocket failed during its second burn, which was really important when putting the spacecraft in the direction it is intended to go, which is Mars. So as a result, Mars 96 re-entered Earth's atmosphere, and it basically got Thanos snapped over the Pacific Ocean, Chile, and Bolivia. Every single thing that they invested in just went poof, Thanos snapped. If you still want to be an astronaut even with all of these stories that I just told you right now, I have to say I am commending you because that is one heck of a courage right there. But you don't have to worry because these kinds of things happen on the rarest of occasions, and let's hope nothing else happens in the future that's anything similarly close to these. You know, so you can moonwalk literally. Ah, whatever. 